Hello and welcome back to Tuesday at Dobbs's. Thank you as always everyone for getting in touch, sharing your thoughts. Best place to do so, comment section below. And if you've got a longer story with photos, it is hi at TuesdayAtDobbs.com. And I've also got an Instagram page, Tuesday underscore at underscore Dobbs. I begin from David. Freddie, your filming room looks like a police interrogation room. Just saying. Good. Thanks, David. Appreciate that. Not to worry, because in... And you are right. I know Monica has seen this comment and she was in floods of tears preparing this room. But not to worry. There'll be no more tears soon, because in three weeks' time, finally have a place sorted. This has taken so long and then we'll be able to properly set up, hopefully a decently nice looking, from an aesthetics point of view, place to film the podcast. So I'm really, really excited about that. Three weeks time, David, if you can wait. But you are right, I can't disagree. On to J and J. Freddie, there are, ah, this is with reference to last week, and the Honda Goldwing 1100s from around about the year 1980. Someone said that they bought one for $2,000, which is about one and a half thousand pounds. So I went on to the classifieds in the UK, hoping I could find a bargain. And I couldn't find one in working order, MOT, good condition, for under six thousand pounds. You can get them for a quarter of the price in North America. So this is from J&J. Freddie, there are tons of Goldwing GL1100s available in Canada. It's sad to say there are so many around that the non-running ones are often scrapped for, for spare parts. The good thing is the used parts market remains very good. J&J, this is unthinkable in the UK. These are becoming really desirable and ridiculously rare. They were built in the US, like I mentioned last time, but I had to check this out. So, I went on to the parking-motorcycle.eu and I typed in Canada 1100 Goldwings. First of all, the, the choice is colossal. Just on this specific website, 27 of this era Goldwing. Prices range from, and this is in euros, bear in mind, not pounds sterling. Pa prices range from 800 euros, 2,400 euros in working order, 1,300 euros in working order. I could go on and on and on. This one I found that I quite like the look of. This is a Honda GL1100 Goldwing. It's in Canada, 1981 model, so US built. 32,000 kilometers on the clock. 1981, $3,500 this is. So that equates to around about 2,700 pounds. But what you get for that, low mileage, 32,000 kilometers. Rare, naked Goldwing in exceptional turnkey condition. You just turn the key and you ride it away. Low kilometers, well maintained, with no needs. Drive it anywhere. Serious offers only, please. It's such a lot of bike for the money. I really can't get my head around how, how good value these are. Surely that's worth it. Anyone looking for a new business? transport Goldwings from North America over to, to Europe. Surely there's a market for such a good looking bike. I move on. Tech phobia. Freddie, I'm an old school biker and I'm a little bit phobic about technology. But recently I needed a new helmet and the nice gentleman at Infinity who sold me my new lid told me there was a discount on Cardo intercoms with new helmet purchases. I'm not keen on being connected while I ride. I kind of like the zen, solitude kind of biking. Yeah, I'm the same as well. But I thought music might be nice, so I had one fitted. Okay, so buy a helmet and retrofit, aftermarket fit, a, an intercom system. I continue. So I had one fitted. This turned out to be a revelation. Firstly, sat-nav instructions. Secondly, music. It's great to have a soundtrack on a beautiful piece of road. Thirdly, my mate and I went for a Sunday ride last week after a lot of button stabbing and a manly refusal to read the instructions. 
We managed to connect our intercoms to each other. What a day. We rode 150 miles and over the Mourne Mountains, along the beautiful County Down coast, and all the while talking absolute beep to each other. Flipping brilliant. Stephen. I didn't say this, Stephen, but I think County Down, Ireland. So many people, Stephen, tell me I, I really must be more open-minded to intercom systems. I'll tell you how vain I am with regards to the bike and the gear. This is pathetic. I don't specifically like the look of an intercom system stuck to the side of a helmet, but I must be more open-minded because I haven't met anyone who has got an intercom system and then thought after a few months, oh, you know what? It's not that good. Everyone I speak to is a complete convert, whether you're an old school biker or a newer biker. So Stephen, thank you. I love this. Okay, this is brilliant. This generated so much discussion. German riders. German riders and their thoughts on classic and retro bikes. Do German riders have an interest in classic bikes or are they tainted by some of the moments of dark history? This is in reference to the conversation last week where we were saying that in Britain, we've got, we love digging back into the history. We love all the old bikes, anything to do with history, nostalgia, we just lap it up. I'm probably a prime example. I would pay over the odds for probably a much worse bike if it's got retro styling and a bit of a story behind it. It's pathetic, I know. But do German bikers like, genuinely like, old school bikes or retro bikes? We discussed that, at least overtly, it seems that the German bikers will, will usually go for power and performance over the style and nostalgia. So here are a few thoughts on that. Do German bikers have a slightly bad impression of, of older bikes, retro bikes, because of the past, the, the dark times in German's history, in Germany's history? Or are we as Brits just looking into this too much? Have a listen to this. Dream Crusher says, Freddie, the Germans simply do not think of World War II to anywhere near the same extent as Brits. We are, we as in Brits, near obsessed with it in comparison to most Europeans. GZK continues, it's because winning, uh, or it's because winning it, I think this is referring to the war, was the last thing this country achieved, with much help from the Commonwealth and the Yanks. That and the football match back in 1966. <laughs> this is so true. 1966, when we won the Football World Cup. We lost an empire, but found an identity and prosperity as a leading and privileged member of the EU. But then we threw that away. On to Benny. Benny, as a rider, 34 years old from Germany, I'll have to disagree with the assumption that the classic BMWs may hark back to those dark days. The reason why you don't see many of the old bikes on the street anymore here is that people don't dare ride them and rather store them in their collections or garages so they don't get dirty or experience a decrease in value. Me excluded. I'd go anywhere with my newly acquired R80 GS. Oh, Benny, I love that. I love that. And great to hear a German's perspective there as well. And I'll wrap this up with Sher Khan. And I think this will wrap it up nicely and, and summarise that. I, I think, at least from reading all of the, the input I've had here, that the Germans actually, they really don't think like that about the older vehicles. They don't think negatively from an older vehicle point of view at all. I think they just prefer to, to keep them and not ride them as much as the new, much more accomplished motorcycles. Shurkan to wrap it up here, German biking. Freddie, as an expat here, I have lived and ridden in Germany since the 1980s. Not riding old airhead BMWs has zero to do with concerning those so-called dark days. They're usually on a pedestal in someone's living room or in a museum. I and a few others have owned them and find these bikes thirstier than a sailor that hasn't seen land for six months. 
Thank you all for that. That was a fascinating, fascinating discussion. I could have gone on and on with that. Really appreciate it. Carbed bikes. I will often say that I will not genuinely consider for myself, for a, a regular daily rider, a carbed motorcycle, a carburetted motorcycle. So when I'm looking at a search for a bike I'm really going to use a lot, I will, I will pick a bike roughly speaking from 2008 onwards because roughly speaking that's when all bikes were fuel injected. And I got some really interesting opinions here on carburetted bikes. Are they as bad as I think they are, or actually are they much easier to live with than I have really given them credit for? This is from Jab Jab. Freddie, I rode carbed bikes for over 20 years, crossed the country on them, raced a bit with them. I never, block capitals never, had to adjust the carbs, ever. If you ride them and don't let the fuel become varnish, you should almost never have to work on the carbs. Buying a used bike that hasn't been used, okay, I get it. But I bought all of my bikes used and sitting and still never had to touch them, besides the carb sink, which almost any mechanic can still handle. I once had a very serious snowmobile that I hated as it never ran well. However, a buddy cleaned the carbs in about 30 minutes, that's 20 minutes having needles soaked in carb cleaner, put it back together and she ran like she was brand new. The cost of this? A six pack of beer. On to Rebel Cowboys RVs. Well, you must, you must be from the US. As Freddie as an automobile, automobile, Freddie as an automobile technician. I hated fuel injection early on. My fuel injected 1970 VW. I had no idea there'd be fuel injected back in the 70s. Wow. Uh, 1970 VW is the bane of my existence. Today I ride a 2009 carburetted bike. I can work on anything carburetted. But today's fuels, and this is a key point here, today's fuels have made them a pain. To know my bike will reliably start next weekend, I have to shut off the fuel at the end of my ride and leave the bike idling until it sucks the carburetor dry, just to keep the corn whiskey in our fuel from gluing the float valve shut in a week. I had two other people mentioning exactly the same thing with carburetted bikes. That's why I wanted to read this out. If you've got a carburetted bike, everyone seems to say the same thing with the new fuel. Shut off the fuel with the tap, keep the bike running until the carbs are completely empty and that seems to keep them in good working order. I continue. So while I can buy a nice classic Goldwing for about two weeks pay, I wouldn't. Besides the existence of the carbs, they are a pain to get to. When I buy another bike, it will be fuel injected and have ABS. I will not buy just to upgrade to fuel injection, but after locking the tire up because of a deer earlier this season, and then again in gravel at an intersection on Sunday, dumping the bike this time, I am willing to buy new to get ABS. And while I'm at it, get rid of the carburetor problem for good. I have my eye on the Royal Enfield Classic 350, would still rather have a real classic, and they are cheaper, but ABS is worth more, and getting away from carburetors makes it even better. See, and that does come from an automobile technician. Very interesting, thank you for that, Rebel Cowboy. Moving on to Chris. Okay, this is, this is a, a painful one to take. This is referring to me saying there are less and less mechanics capable of working on carburetted bikes now. Freddie, you're so right about the skills to work on older bikes just not being around anymore. Last year I decided to return to bikes after a lot of years. In a fit of nostalgia, I bought a Suzuki GS850G, 1985 model, 
4,000 miles on the clock from new and absolutely immaculate. It cost just under £5,000. The carbs had all been cleaned apparently and it started on the button. I got it one and a half thousand what am I talking about? One and a half thousand. I got it 1.5 miles down the road and it stopped and I just managed to limp it back on two cylinders. I contacted the local bike shop and they flatly refused to touch it. They just said it was too much trouble. Finally, a guy I know who runs the other shop in town agreed to pick it up. That was back in May. By the end of July, it still was in the shop, untouched, and by now it was looking really sad with leaky fork seals as well as other problems. Get ready for this. I lost heart and ended up selling it to him for his collection for £2,000. Is that the most expensive one and a half miles anyone has ever done? That is £3,000 for one and a half miles. Yes, that is the most expensive one and a half miles, surely. Chris, that is so painful. I'd love to know if you, you swapped it for a newer bike with fuel injection. See, this is my fear, Chris, honestly, with older bikes. I know a lot of people disagree, but newer bikes, they're just so much more reliable. I know I'll get a bit of hate for that, but I just think they're more reliable, especially with injection, because I've had issues with carb bikes. Chris, thank you. Painful story. Moving on to Brian and Cheshire. Freddie, I am a loyal BMW Motorrad customer of 40 years having started as a Honda rider. Over those years, I've spent a minimum of 150 to 200,000 pounds plus buying bikes and have always, and always having them serviced by a BMW dealer. The bikes have traveled all over Europe and I have always been able to enjoy the top specs with luxury, sat nav, etc. And it has been great. My present bike is a, two, is a 2016 GS 1200 LCTE spec from new, 40,000 miles on the clock. Again, full dealer service history, truly mint condition for its age. But recently, age getting the better of me, plus the chance to splash the cash from my pension lump sum, I've dipped my toe into the exchange market. I've been utterly dismayed and disgusted Gusted by the trade in values and appetite by the BMW dealer network for my bike. One said they were not interested because they couldn't take the bike into stock. Others have offered at best derisory trade in values via their trade partners, but all have said the same thing. At that age, 40,000 miles on the clock, the bike has little value. The point I'm making here is when you buy a new BMW Motorrad model, you are told they will travel tr twice around the globe. That's what they're built for and their residual values are really strong as everybody wants them, especially with a full dealer history. Absolute beep. Brian, I was fascinated by this. So I had a look. I had a look at a few of these online. So if I'm looking at, and I used Auto Trader for, for sake of argument here, if I have a look at BMW GSs from 2016 onwards, they started around about seven and a half thousand pounds or so. And it's really hard to put a figure on the new prices of these from 2016 because with all of the, the added extras, you can easily raise the price massively. But they started at about twelve and a half thousand pounds in 2016. So if you had a base model, you'd have lost about five thousand pounds by now. But if you look at equivalent KTM 1090 Adventure from 2016 or a Triumph Tiger 1200 from 2016, those prices are a good thousand pounds, maybe one and a half thousand pounds less than the BMW. So that BMW, your one, for example, minimum value, minimum seven and a half thousand pounds if you're looking to sell it privately. 
and the traders will sell it for seven and a half K. That is still a valuable bike, Brian. It's just the dealers never offer anything. It, they always, always give such a microscopically low price. I know from previous experience with a couple of cars, I just gave up trying to sell to dealers because the prices were so low. So you've got a valuable bike there, Brian. You're just going to have to sell it on Facebook Marketplace. I really believe it. Put it on there. Get prepared for 80% of people to be trying to scam you and con you. But whittle it down to the magic 20% or so and you will sell it. I'm certain, Brian. They are still desirable bikes. And the interesting thing is with the BMW GSs, they sold in much bigger numbers than the Triumph Tiger 1200 and the KTM 1090 Adventure. Way, way bigger numbers. Yet still they hold their value significantly better than those two bikes. So they really do hold their value. One other thing to mention as well, this is a BMW GS and it's so frustrating when, whether it's dealers or whoever, they, they class 40,000 miles as a lot, it's nothing. Nothing for a GS at all. They will do without any question three times that mileage. And I'm sure a lot more. I'm sure. I've heard some 200,000 miles. Brian, good luck. Good luck. Police auctions. I move on. Okay, let me start with, with John. With reference to last week, and I was discussing police auctions, not just buying police, ex-police motorbikes, but also stolen recovered bikes from the police that they want to get rid of. A lot of people said that I was being completely unrealistic looking at the auctions because I had to look at the last five seconds to see what the vehicles actually sold for. But you'll have to bear with me for, for entertainment purposes. I just couldn't wait until the end of the auction. Although I did look after the podcast and the prices were still very, very reasonable. So this is in reference to police auctions. I'll start with John. Freddie, beware buying ex-police cars and motorbikes. As has been said, police vehicles have not been MOT'd. Totally stupid, I know. So it's highly likely that they've been clocked, i.e. the mileage has just been wound back. A lot of people said this, which amazed me. So the mileage will have been clocked before putting onto the market to the general public. So many people said this to me, John. And I know this sounds obvious. I sound like a, a pathetic snitch, but is that not surely breaking the law, clocking a vehicle? And it's the police doing it? I can't quite get my head around that, but a lot of people echoed that, John. I continue. I've bought an ex-police Land Rover Discovery from a dealer who bought it at one of the closed auctions for police vehicles and it was a complete nail. I thought I could make a car out of it but after three months of trying and many thousands of pounds I cut my losses and that was about five thousand pounds and I sold it via online auction. If I can find a direct from police, BMW RT, I'd want to buy it, but only after checking the paperwork that should come with it. I'm still looking. On to Sean. Freddie, if you buy an ex-police bike, expect to do work on it. Many, and I do mean many, years ago, a courier company I was involved with bought or thought it would be a good idea to buy a small fleet of identical ex-police bikes, BMW R80 RTPs. They bought 10 of these bikes at auction and sent a minibus full of couriers to collect them. Of the 10 bikes, only one, wow, only one made it back to Guildford. The rest broke down along the way, mostly with silly niggles and mostly electrical or adjustment related. Eventually they recovered them all and most of them, most of them gave good service for a couple of years. But as I recall, two or three of them were too bad to be usable and became donor bikes for the rest of the fleet. Okay, I asked, please tell me some auctions. Tell me where I can buy a direct 
police motorbike from. And Carl replied, Brightwell's auction in Leominster sells police cars and bikes. I'm sure I've saved one example. Here we go. Brightwell's auctions. You're absolutely right. I found two motorbikes here, police motorbikes, and this is a direct auction for a police motorbike. There's no intermediary here, so you'll be buying direct from the police. So you go onto the auction, which is Brightwell's auction, and I just typed in motorcycle, and two motorbikes popped up. This Kawasaki ZG1400 popped up. Pictures of the bike, and what you get below are the details of that specific motorcycle. And it's in-depth enough for me to have enough confidence to buy it, at least in my eyes. So, pictures all look good of this perfectly smart looking Kawasaki. It has a current bid of zero pounds, and this ends on the 19th of October. Okay, so this is on Thursday this week. So if you're keen on a BMW, Soaring police bike or this Kawasaki get onto Brightwell's auction. Here's what it says about this Kawasaki. The year it was made 2015, engine size, import status, mileage 44,000, inclusive of VAT, buyer's premium, rem re buyer's premium, remember this, minimum 300 pounds or seven and a half percent buyer's premium. So you have to add that on. Seller, the police. Cap average, I'm guessing that means market rate average for the bike, 5,800 pounds. Chassis number, lot location. And here's the key thing, V5 logbook, present and correct. The MOT ran out 10 days ago. Okay, that's a shame. The MOT has run out. So I would suggest you take a risk on this, book an MOT within about three miles of the auction site. Take a risk, take it to an MOT. And I would say you've surely got a pretty good chance of this passing. It looks like a very straight bike, but there you go. Police auction direct from police. Carl, thank you. Oh, this is good the US. I'll wrap this up with auctions from Steve. Freddie, you know what? When I was young, the old guys would tell me, you get the best Harley Davidsons at the police auctions. Many a panhead chopper here in the US started life as a police bike. Mine did. You can always tell because they had the old police special speedo on them. The one or the old ones had a button on them to lock the speedo needle to show the speeder how fast he was going when the cop caught him. You know, Steve, I had to get these pan heads up. I typed in police, pan head police Harley. And I can just imagine the old school police in the US riding these around. That would have been Oh, an incredible sight. I can picture it now. Aviator sunglasses just cruising along the highways on these. That's a really beautiful bike with that floating seat as well. Huge front mudguard. Lovely, lovely looking things. Really beautiful. This is interesting because if you're on a high speed chase and you're having to go after someone, bearing in mind you're on a, a pan head Harley Davidson, so it won't be the first word in dynamism or performance. You're going flat out on this bike, trying to catch someone. And then as you're going along at top speed, you have to press a button to hold the speedo there. Then you pull someone over, I guess, beckon them over to your bike and say, there you go. That's the speed you were doing there while pointing to the speedo. That's such a brilliant little story. I would love to have one of those old police pan heads and keep that speedo. Brilliant. Moving on. What are you all riding? This is from Juan in the US. I'll put pictures up as I discuss this because this looks like such a fun route. Freddie, have you heard of the BDR, the Backcountry Discovery Routes in the USA, especially the Wild Pennsylvania BDRX? 
So this is a 500 mile route across the Pennsylvania state forests, running mostly on dirt and gravel roads. And it's, it's a proper route set up and you can pick wherever you want to start on that route. And then you just do the entire circuit, mainly through beautiful countryside, forests, all soft off-roading, but 500 miles through this beautiful scenery. I ride, I carry on from Juan, I ride a Kawasaki KLR650 on the road, or on this road, the BDR road, but I also have a Honda Shadow and a Harley. Juan, it looks incredible. I spent about 10 minutes Googling some pics of this. Beautiful stuff. On to David. Hi, Freddie. I travelled 180 miles from my home in Derby to a campsite in Yoxford at £15 a night. Pictured. I also own a BMW GS1250 for camping adventures and longer journeys, but I'm lucky enough to own on top of that Tramp Thruxton for short trips, maybe 50 miles or so. I feel it's the perfect combination for the back road bimbles and motorway munching adventures. However, I still feel the need for another bike. 45 years of riding and I've never owned a Harley. David, if you've got that in your mind now, beautiful pair, by the way. If you have that, David, in your mind about a Harley Davidson, please take it from me. It is a niche that must be scratched. And the only reason I say that, not having ever owned a Harley, I've been dreaming of own a, owning a Harley for probably 13 years now since passing my test. And I still dream of owning one. And on to Ben in Australia. Hi, Freddie. I've just bought a Royal Enfield Hunter, but I'm so torn between my new bike and my old bike. The Honda, I'd never heard of this, Ben. Honda VT 250C. It's such a great looker, rides like a brick, but it's a stunner in my opinion. She is old, 1994, but just look at it. Is this like having a wife and a mistress? I think that's a brilliantly unique looking 250, Ben. Really, really good looking bike. They never sold those in the UK. It must just be Australia, well, Japan, of course, and over that side of the world because I've never come across it. VT250 from Honda. Ben, thank you. I move on to bike of the week from William. Freddie here is my present bike, pictured. It's a 2009 model Honda CBF 600 SA. It's a fantastic bike. I bought mine for £3,000, which was slightly over average, but it had only done 5,500 miles on the clock and was in pretty much mint condition. It's got a reputation of being a bit boring, if anything, but if boring means super cheap to run, super smooth and comfortable to ride all day long and super reliable with legendary Honda build quality, then I'll take that all day long. With 76 horsepower on tap and a super smooth and super sounding four cylinder fuel injected engine, I never found it boring to ride. And for me, it is the nigh on perfect all rounder for anyone who wants to consider touring, commuting, or just popping down to the shops for a coffee. For me, the Honda CB600SA is the best bike I've ever owned. William. William, this is very close to the era of the first bike I ever bought. 2008 to 2013, the one you've got here, William. This is what you sent me, MCN Review. Funnily enough, MCN gave it three out of five, which for them is low. But there are no concerns about the ride quality at four stars out of five, although the engine gets a score of three out of five. I think, from what I can see, the only downsides is a perceived lack of character as opposed to anything fundamentally wrong with the engine. I found a 2008 Honda CBF 600 SA on Facebook Marketplace, 53,000 miles on the clock, which for a Honda is nothing at all. And I'm going to put pictures up as I discuss this. This sounds like a very honest seller. Honda CBF 600 for sale. Good condition for the year and mileage. 
there is a scratch on the tank, a better tank pad would cover most of it. Nine service stamps in the book, nine months MOT left. Advisory for the front brake pads and slight wear on the rear disc, but plenty of life left. I have the bike booked in for full service in a few days, so new pads will be fitted, oil and filter change, new plugs, new air filter. Selling as I don't want to ride a big bike anymore. It's an age thing, I'm afraid. I've been honest about the bike. It comes with all the luggage. It's got all the luggage. Look at these pictures. These are Honda panniers with a top box so you are set for european cruising on this bike it's even got a 12 volt cigarette lighter socket 12 volt usb socket spotlights fully serviced with the new owner no time wasters genuine bike genuine reason for sale if it's still here advertised it means the bike is still available i actually think personally and tell me if i'm being crazy here I think this is a good looking bike. I quite like it, especially in the gunmetal gray type color. I think that's a perfectly respectable looking bike. I don't know if it's because I used to own one very similar as my first bike, but I, I have a, a funny connection to these bikes. Maybe it's a Honda thing. I just really like them. So that's that. And let me just wrap this up this week's episode with one final bike, because I was looking through or as I was looking through, William, at these bikes, something else popped up. In essence, my exact first ever bike, except a 600cc instead of 500cc that I had. But in essence, they look almost identical. The 2006 Honda CBF 600. So in essence, the naked version of the bike that William has. And again, call me crazy, but has this bike just started to look really good? It's bottomed out in value, no question at all. I think this is a really nice looking bike. 2006 model, 2,000 pounds, 34,000 miles on the clock. And have a listen to this to wrap it up. Two grand for this bike. Well maintained, brand new rear tire, professional detailing, full service, a few extras including heated grip, spectacular to ride, no faults, ready to ride away, has an MOT until next year, two keys, V5 logbook for the new owner. Offers accepted. I mean, if you can get this bike for 1,700 pounds, that is going to be a brilliant little workhorse that I think is starting to come into its own from a looks point of view. And I bought near enough this exact bike when I passed my test 13 years ago and the mileage was almost exactly the same and I paid £1,850. And that means that these bikes have in essence bottomed out and flatlined for the past 13 years or so. I love those old Hondas. I'll wrap it up there. Thanks everyone for watching. Have a brilliant week and thank you so much all for your continued input and sharing your thoughts. It's all hugely appreciated. Have a great week.